Although Mario 2 is more than a worthy successor to the original, I have never been a big fan of the Mario 3. While the additions this game made to the series are more than welcome, I've never really seen anything from the game that truly excels. But hey, since I have to play it now, maybe my opinion will change. Maybe I'll even end up agreeing with everyone who says this is their favourite Mario game. Yeah, I... I don't... First thing you'll notice when booting up the game is the terrible art style. I can't even put my finger on what makes it so ugly, but it just looks so bad. You couldn't even get Mario right in this game. Mario, the main character! The best part of the graphics I still feel hold up are the enemy designs. Like the Boos, Buster Beetles, Chain Chumps, Hot Foots, hell, even the Shoe Goomba. But this game is just so ugly. L look at the Buzzy Beetle. They literally just took the sprite from the first game and put it in. The best part of the presentation is the soundtrack, and yeah, it's good. Tracks like World Map 1, the matching game, and the Hammer Bros theme all come to mind. But honestly, this game's soundtrack doesn't even come close to reaching the level of Mario 2's soundtrack, even with the increased list of songs. And I really don't even think it's in the top 30 Mario soundtracks, if I'm honest. It's just good, nothing more, nothing less. Starting the game will take you to the world map, and I like this feature a lot. In the previous games, the level would just sort of start. With the world map, you get an idea of the scale of this adventure, so for some reason you can't go back to a world you've already beaten. But on the plus side, you can skip levels you don't want to do, given that there's another option. This concept is introduced very well in the first world. After level 2, you can either go to level 3 or 4, but they go even further with this by making an obvious path to the mid castle, skipping both level 2 and 3. This instills the idea that you can skip levels by making use of the world map, and it's a great concept. If you're stuck on a level for whatever reason, you can choose a different option given that there's one available. You can also collect a stash of items throughout your adventure, and they can be used at any time on the world map. Cool idea. Plus, it's just kinda cool to be able to access minigames within the map. There's a whopping two types of minigames. The spade panel hosts a slot machine-like game where you have to match three rows with the same result. Make a full power-up icon and you win some extra lives. It's a fine mini game, but I'm pretty sure the game is rigged to have a random delay every time you select a row. And then there's the end marked spade panel, which will only appear once every 80,000 points collected. It hosts a memory match game, and for each pair of cards you match, you get whatever is on that card in your world map inventory. The funny thing is that the game will try to act like the best result out of all the cards as a one-up considering there's only one of them, but I highly doubt you'll be too low on lives to be desperate for it. Why? Because of this thing. At the end of each level, there's a roulette with three icons on it. A mushroom, a flower, and a star. Once you touch the roulette, you get whatever icon the roulette was on when you touched it. After getting three icons, you'll get an extra life if you get three icons of the same type. This sounds pretty challenging, but the difficulty is totally gone when you realize that if you build up to max speed and hit the corner as soon as you can, you will get a star icon every single time. Once you learn the trick, the lives are completely obsolete. There is technically one more minigame on the world map, and that's the Hammer Bros battle. Every time you beat a stage, these guys will shuffle around on the world map, and if you manage to bump into them, a confrontation with them begins. And after you defeat them, you'll get an item to be used on the world map. These are pretty easy, and the items they drop usually aren't worth wasting your time over, so I wish they could be avoided. Oh wait, yeah, they can. Sometimes they can drop a music box, and if you use it on the world map, all Hammer Bros will be put to sleep. It's a pretty useless item in the grand scheme of things, but I do appreciate its addition since it allows me to waste less time. And hey, since we're here, we might as well cover all the other world map items. Lakitu's Cloud can often be found from the Hammer Bros battles. You can use these to skip levels. So if a level is giving you a hard time or you simply can't be bothered doing it, you can use a cloud to go in your merry way. There is one more world map item, but you can only access it under specific circumstances. In each world, there's a specific level where collecting enough coins unlocks a special toad house, the white toad house. And here you get access to a special item. And what does it do? Well, you're looking at it right now. All this thing does is keep the airship level from moving to a different spot on the world map. For context, at the end of each world there's an airship level, and if you happen to die in said level, it'll move away to a different spot on the map. And all the anchor does is stop it from doing that. It's useless. Imagine being a 1 in 10,000 kid in 1988, getting the rarest secret in the game just to get this. It's laughable that this item is even in the game in the first place. If you're gonna have a special item that not many can access, at least 
least make it good. But if an airship escapes, all you gotta do is go to the place it went to on the world map. Which takes, what, about 10 seconds? Why is this even here? What even is this thing? Well, I guess since we're here covering the items used on the world map, we might as well talk about the power-ups. There's a whopping 9 power-ups in this game. 6 being original. Which is pretty cool. But I use the word original lightly, because really there's only 3 truly original ones. Let's go one by one. The raccoon suit allows you to whip shit, slow your fall, and when at full speed, even fly. I believe this choice was made for balancing, and yeah, I can see that, but I don't see a reason why they had to make the power-up less satisfying to use just to balance it out. I can easily see Nintendo doing something like a limited use thing. What if after, say, 10 uses of the glide ability, it becomes less and less powerful until it eventually stops working, and you gotta touch the ground to be able to use it properly again? That's the best approach I can think of, as it negates its overpowered nature in a way that retains its fun factor. There's two different power-ups that relate to the raccoon suit, but for now, the frog suit improves water levels drastically, especially considering how slow and shitty Mario controls when underwater. But on land, it completely destroys his movement. I think just by proxy of having a prominent downside that even matters, this is one of the worst power-ups out there. And I shouldn't have to explain why this power-up sucks, but just for those who somehow haven't figured it out yet, it's super situational. You wanna know how many levels are actually water levels? Alright, so there's 10 water levels. That's nothing! So if you play with only this power-up, a ninth of it is going to be decent and the rest is going to be absolute misery. I understand that you have to make your power-up more unique, but something we'll get to later on clearly outlines the fact that they did not care how original their power-ups were. Don't use this. The final, and probably the least annoying one, is the hammer suit. This is a pretty rare item, and it allows you to shield yourself from fireballs, and of course throw hammers. It's a cool idea, and the fact that the hammers can kill literally anything is a fun idea. But dude, the arc the hammers move at is terrible. With the power up that's meant for offense, it does not do that job well. Still, with a few revisions here and there, I think this could be a great power up. So with that out of the way, what's with these two power ups? How do they relate to the raccoon suit, like I said earlier? <laughs> well, I think it's pretty obvious. They're just carbon copies of the raccoon suit. Yes, you heard that right. With the exception of a few things, they are largely the same. The P-Wing is the more different of the two. The P-Wing is essentially the same as the raccoon suit, but with the flight ability being infinite and always accessible. Much like the cloud, this is an item you'll mostly be using to skip levels you don't want to do. And as far as those go, it's one of the best in the series. The less forgivable one is the Tanuki suit. And what does it do? Everything the raccoon suit can. You might be asking, are there any new additions to this power-up? And then yeah, you're looking at it right now. This power-up is just the same as the raccoon suit, except you can turn into a statue for a short while. This ability is useful in the right circumstances. But is it fun? Fuck no! You're just going immobile for a short amount of time and then going back to playing the game. Honestly, now that I'm looking at this game from an analytical stance, I'm just now realizing that as a whole, the power-ups in this game are pretty shit. There is one more power-up in this game, the Goomba Shoe. If you ever stumble across a shoe Goomba throughout the game, you can actually get a shoe from it by hitting it from underneath with a block. The shoe sounds pretty niche at first. You can safely touch spiky objects. That doesn't sound very useful. I mean, how's that gonna help you in a level with no spikes? Well, you can't get the Goomba Shoe in a level with no spikes. Yeah, the Goomba Shoe is pretty weird in that it only appears in one level, being 5-3. And the level is filled with munches, spinies, and piranha plants, all of which Mario is protected from due to the shoe. What's better is that unlike normal power-ups, it stacks, meaning that no matter the power-up you currently have, you can still use it. So you can be Fire Mario, Raccoon Mario, hell, even Frog Mario, and still use the shoe. This idea was used again in Super Mario World with Yoshi, but... Well, we'll get to that when we talk about Mario World. But other than the Goomba Shoe, which I find to be a pretty good power-up, Mario 3's selection isn't the best. All the concepts here are really good, but most of them fail to execute on the idea. With a few revisions, all of these could be really good power-ups. But as it is, yeah, they're pretty weak. And that sucks because there's a lot of good ideas in this game, but it's kind of outweighed by the shitty execution. Like this level, 6-5. It's a pretty cool idea, needing you to have a raccoon suit and grab the scooper shell, then fly up here and kick the shell to get the exit. But this is conveyed horribly. Most people would just go back and forth throughout this level wondering where to go, when literally all they needed to do was have a sign here saying, Go up. But no, the fucking, for some reason, the player is just meant to figure it out by themselves. 
I know you can see a hole at the top of the screen, but no one would even think to go up there. A similar thing happens in World Seven's Mid Castle. In fact, it's even worse. You start the level in this room made entirely of bricks, and you're meant to break through this line of bricks to hit the switch. But again, this is conveyed so poorly, it's laughable. A regular player would just pass by considering there's a door here. But who in their right minds would assume that there's something one block from the far right? Nobody, that's who. But this next part, oh, it's fantastic, phenomenal. After you hit the switch that's in the block, this door appears, and once you go in, you're led to this room with the Tanuki suit. You may be wondering, what's next? Your guess is as fucking good as mine because the level designer was probably laughing while making this. What you're meant to do is fly to the top of the main room with the Tanuki suit at this completely random spot in the room. So let me ask a perfectly reasonable question, level designer. Where do you live? I mean, what the hell in this level informs you that you're meant to fly into this random spot in this random room where there is literally nothing but blocks and platforms and nothing to actually give you a clue as to where you're supposed to go? Sorry, the level design is hit or miss as a whole, honestly. I feel Mario 2 struck a perfect balance between easy and hard while still having some experimental level design. The level design here often integrates Mario 1 level dumbassery, like one block platforms. This isn't helped by almost every level being really short. Whereas Mario 2, again, struck a perfect balance between too long and too short, these ones are just too short. So despite the short length of the levels, the game manages to be pretty long playthrough since there's a whopping 90 levels. That's a lot of levels for 40 kilobytes a cartridge space. And keep in mind that even though the levels are around half the size, that's four and a half times the levels. The level themes are all different for the first time, but I say the word different slightly. Worlds 2, 3, 5, 6, and 8 are all fine. Sure, some of them were done before, but that doesn't really matter considering we're so early into this retrospective. But worlds 4 and 7, they just sort of feel like regular worlds with themes already done in the game. Sure, the enemies are trying in world 4 and there's a few pipe themed stages in world 7, but they still feel like your standard grassy stages. And I don't know if this is just me, but something about this game just feels indistinct. It could be the number of levels, maybe it could also be the less interesting level paths, but honestly, up until the last world, I could barely tell if I was making progress. Outside of the times I paid attention to where I was in the game. And the bosses certainly don't help. Yeah, while 2D Mario bosses kind of suck in general, these might be some of the absolute worst. First off, the bosses really are just too similar. There's seven Koopalings, and each and every one of them does basically the same thing. They shoot stuff at you and jump. Sure, there might be minor differences here and there, but they're pretty negligible. Second, they're too easy to cheese. Like, way too easy, it's mindless. Getting that first hit might be moderately challenging depending on who you're fighting, but after that first hit they might as well hand you the win because it's over, since you can just bounce on their head as soon as they get back up. Honestly, despite the Bowser fight being the most different, the battle with Wendy probably ended up being my favourite, which isn't saying much. But the reason why is because it was actually slightly, and I do mean slightly challenging. The reason why is because the projectile she shoots bounce across the room at a decent speed, and they don't go away for about 20 seconds. The fact that the attacks bleed into the next hit point of the boss makes it less easy to bounce on the head as soon as she gets back up, and it makes the fight a little bit more engaging. And that final confrontation with Bowser, fucking lord dude. I was genuinely expecting something here considering this is a pretty iconic boss, but it was disappointing as usual. All he does is shoot a few fireballs and occasionally jump to do a ground pound on you. What you want to do is stand on the bricks in the middle and move out the way as he's doing the ground pound, so he ends up hitting the bricks instead and breaking them. After he's broken all the bricks on a certain column, he'll dip into the lava. It's a really fun idea, I've always loved bosses that make you use their attacks against them, but it was over in a flash, it took around a minute and a half which is never a good sign for a final boss, and it just sort of ends up being a super anticlimactic way to go out, and that seems to be a theme with these games. But he's not the worst boss in the game, not even by a long shot, because this fucker, right here, you gotta fight this bastard 17 times! Seriously, he might be one of my least favourite video game bosses ever, because of the abundance of fights and lack of changes. At most of the room you fight him in will be made of ice, or he'll get wings or something. But I'm not even gonna act like him having wings is a good change, because like with the Koopalings, you can curb stomp this asshole's head into the ground as soon as he gets back up, and that just invalidates any changes he gets across the game. I'm not wasting any more time talking about this guy, he doesn't deserve it. I'd rather have Mario 1's Bowser because at least that wastes my time less. Though honestly, it's a miracle I can even jump on the boss's heads to begin with, because the controls are really weird in this game. Not bad, honestly I think passable is the right word to use, but it's just sort of jarring. It's very hard to describe it without playing it yourself, so I won't hold on it for much longer, but it feels strange and not very good in a way that's indescribable. But to be fair, it works well enough. At least there is air control, unlike Mario 1. 
Because if there wasn't, I probably would have had a fucking aneurysm. Guess what I have in store in a few games. Honestly, I think one of the only things everyone can agree is bad in this game are the auto scrollers. And look, I know these are wildly hated and all, but I can't be my usual contrarian self here. They're really annoying. And there's too many of them. I think there might have been more auto scrollers than water levels here, and that's never a good sign. Most of these are taken up by the airship levels, the final levels of each world, and every single one of those is an auto scroller. There's also like four or five extra airship levels in the last world, so that's at least like 12 auto scrollers throughout the game. And they get so, so repetitive. These levels usually take around two minutes. And while that's not at all a bad length for a regular level, the scrolling is simply too slow here to be anything short of boring. Honestly, one of the only auto scrollers I wasn't bored by was the jet level in World 8. It's an auto scroller, but the scrolling is much more frantic and fast. That's more engaging to me than the slow one, obviously, but it still doesn't give the player control of how fast they want to go. Some players will obviously like a slower pace than others, but not giving the player control makes the less experienced players have a small modicum of fun and makes the other half want to put a bullet through their head. Want to know how many auto scrollers there are in this game? 18. Combined with the amount of water levels, that's 28 levels, or almost a third of the game of annoyance. Who designed this game? Aliens? Dogs? I genuinely don't know because this is fucking idiotic, it's baffling. And this is not going to be the last time we see auto scrollers. In fact, I'm pretty sure a few of them appear in the very next game. Fuck. Honestly, the one redeeming factor I could say about this game, and a real bonus, not something like enemy variety, is the two player. Unlike the two player mode in Mario 1 where you have to pass up to player 2 when you die, in this one it's the next player's turn once you beat a level. And this is a fun approach. Because in Mario 1 it's more of a waiting game because player 1 is obviously going to be better than the other. But here, every player gets an equal amount of turns. It's pretty fun to collaborate to beat levels together, but my only real complaint is that it can't decide on whether it wants to be a cooperative game or a versus game. You can interact with the other player on the world map, which starts a versus minigame similar to the Mario Bros arcade game. Combining a co-op adventure with a versus one, as well as allowing either player to switch how they want to play on the fly, creates this jarring and awkward experience that could have easily just been a co-op adventure, but I think they did a relatively decent job with it. That's sort of how I'd describe the game as a whole though. While it's got a lot of well done aspects, the game as a whole just ends up being nothing more than a fun experience and likely something I'm not ever going to come back to. I'm not saying you shouldn't try the game, it's definitely worth your time and maybe it'll appear more to you than me. But as I said, I don't think I'll ever find a reason to come back to this game unless if I do a Mario series marathon in the future, which will likely happen at some point. I'm putting this right between Mario 1 and 2 on the ranking. It's got good enough qualities to be right above Mario 1, but it's got enough bad qualities and it's just forgettable enough for Mario 2 to be better. Anyways, next game. Ah, sweet. Mario's first portable adventure. Portable games always for some reason end up being my favourites. For no particular structure or reason other than they usually just end up being more fun. I mean, Mario Kart DS is my favourite game of all time, and the entire Wario Land series is up there for me, but that's for a later video. But as of now, try Mario 3. Maybe it's right up your alley. But for me, it's fun. I had fun. But let's see what this next game has in store.